All right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Inaugural Sites Online Speaker Night. My name is Lenora Henson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Theodore Roosevelt Inaugural National Historic Site, and I want to thank each of you for joining us. I especially want to say thank you to all of the TR site members who are with us today. Your support is always appreciated, but even more so in the context of the pandemic and all of the uncertainty that comes along with it. Theodore Roosevelt's inaugural site in Buffalo, New York is delighted that the magic of Zoom has allowed us to continue our monthly speaker night series during the pandemic. Speaker night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to help us think not only about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today, but also to think more broadly about TR's life and his legacy. Tonight's talk has a fantastic title and that um, everyone, uh, uh, let's see, and that uh, everyone has probably seen already, uh, Behind Every Great Man is a Great Woman, the Women Who Influenced Theodore Roosevelt. And while I dare say everyone here would be interested in the topic, regardless of the time of the year, we are particularly pleased to bring you this talk during uh, Women's History Month. And I'm gonna try, and I'm getting some chat messages. I'm gonna try, all right. Um, Travis tells me there's some issue with my video. Well, you don't really need to see me. Um, I'll just, can, uh, Travis, if you can let me know, can, are you hearing me? Or if someone else can. Okay. All right, we will figure out, figure this out. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> That's always, it's helpful to know what's going on. But um, as I was saying, tonight's talk has a fantastic title, Behind Every Great Man is a Great Woman, The Woman Who Influenced Theodore Roosevelt. I'm excited to welcome Laura Cinturati back to the TR Sites Speaker Night series. Um, we are so honored to have her here with us. We couldn't do this, however, without the generous financial support of our series sponsors. So our thanks go out to Erie County and the New York State Council on the Arts, NISCA. Our gratitude also goes out to this evening's co-sponsors, Sagamore Hill National Historic Site and the Friends of Sagamore Hill. Special thanks go out to Sagamore Hill Site Superintendent Jonathan Parker for his support. Later on, and actually Brian is um, on the panel with me. Um, I think some of you may, I may be able to see him. Brian Tadler, who is on board of Friends of Sagamore Hill, uh, will join us uh, and facilitate our Q&A at the end of the presentation. The inaugural site is delighted to be working with such wonderful partners on this program. The final person on our panel is Travis Ratka, um, who is the TR Sites Programming Assistant and Designated Technology Troubleshooter. Having said all of that, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Laura Cinturati is a museum technician with National Park Service who has worked in the curatorial department at Sagmar Hill National Historic Site for six years. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Wellesley, Wellesley College and a master's in museum studies from John Hopkins University. But she's another native Long Islander who grew up in the town next to TR's home at Sagamore Hill. She now helps take care of that home and its vast collection. Laura, thanks so much for being here and telling us about uh, the women who influenced Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you, Lenora. I'm very happy to be back with the TR inaugural site. Um, I had the opportunity of doing a lecture up in Buffalo a couple of years ago, um, so it's very nice to be back again. I'm not sure if people can see me right now, but hopefully you can see the presentation. So um, as Lenora said, I'm a museum technician at Sagamore Hill National Historic Site, which is Theodore Roosevelt's home on Long Island. I have the privilege of taking care of his house and the many objects inside that belong to the Roosevelt family. The common saying behind every great man is a great woman can certainly be applied to Theodore Roosevelt and the women in his life. There are many significant female figures who helped shape the path of his life, including his mother, two sisters, two wives, two daughters, plus a famous niece, three daughters-in-law, extended family, friends, and various social and political reformers. 
Tonight, we'll do an overview of some of these important women, but focus in on two of the women who influenced Theodore Roosevelt the most. His sister, Anna Bammy Roosevelt Cowles, and his second wife, Edith Kermit Roosevelt. As a note, I will refer to Anna as Bammy during this presentation, since it's the name that she's most referred to by Theodore Roosevelt, Edith, and modern historians. Let's start off with an overview of TR's family, female family members. Each of these women bear an extraordinary story, and I wish we had the time to delve into each of them. If you're interested in learning more, the last slide in this presentation contains a list of books that further explore the Roosevelt women. Hey, Laura, I'm just going to jump in um, and I'm going to send you, try and uh, send you a prompt to start your video. Okay. I think I will um, maybe exit full screen. There we go. That, there we go. Now we can see you. Okay. And is everyone able to see the presentation again? Um, if anyone's having trouble with that, let us know in the chat. But I think we're good. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, okay. Laura. Thank you. Without the woman on the left, there would have been no Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt's mother, Martha Mitty Bullock, was a Southern belle who came from a prominent family in Georgia. She's rumored to be the inspiration for Margaret Mitchell's Scarlett O'Hara. Mitty married Theodore Roosevelt Sr. in 1853 at her family's home, Bullock Hall in Roswell, Georgia. Following their wedding, she joined her husband in New York City to make their home. Mitty was known for her beauty, wit, and charm. She captivated her children and visitors to their house with tales of what it was like growing up in the South, but Mitty also struggled with her mental health. She felt isolated as a Southerner in the North, particularly during the Civil War. She bore four children in the span of six years. She was obsessive about cleanliness and preferred to only wear white. Her children viewed her as delicate with TR and his siblings addressing their letters to her as dear little motherling. After her husband's death in 1878 due to stomach cancer, Bammy, Mitty's daughter, had to step in to manage the home. Though there were happy occurrences in the final years of her life, with three out of her four children getting married between 1880 and 1883, Mitty would not live to see most of her grandchildren or even her son Theodore become president of the United States. She died of typhoid fever on February 14, 1884, the same day as TR's wife, Alice Lee Roosevelt. Moving on to TR's younger sister on the right, Corinne Roosevelt Robinson was the baby of the family. Her youth had friendship with Edith Kermit Corot brought Edith into the Roosevelt circle and changed the course of TR's life forever. But their friendship would become strained after TR and Edith's marriage. Corinne feared that Edith would push Corinne and Bammy farther from TR. Though TR's relationship with his sisters did change after his marriage to Edith, Corinne continued to engage in political discussions with TR and host political meetings for him. Corinne preferred to be behind the scenes politically, however, and did not support women's suffrage. Following the death of TR and women gaining the right to vote, Corinne began to participate in politics publicly. She was a member of the Executive Committee of the Republican National Committee and the New York State Republican Committee. She was the first woman ever to be called upon to second the nomination of a National Party Convention candidate during the election of 1920. Corinne was also an accomplished writer and a published poet. She published six volumes of her poetry and a biography of her brother, Theodore Roosevelt. Alice Hathaway Lee Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt's first wife. TR met Alice when he was in college at Harvard. He was so entranced by her beauty and athleticism that he became determined to win her over and marry her. TR nicknamed Alice Sunshine and was overjoy overjoyed when she finally accepted his marriage proposal. The pair wed on Theodore Roosevelt's 22nd birthday in October, 1880. Alice had a good relationship with her in-laws. Mitty, Bammy, and Corinne all approved of her and her relationship with Theodore. After their marriage, their pair moved to New York City, and Alice looked to Mitty and Bammy for examples on how to set up her household. Alice gave birth to their daughter, Alice Lee, on February 12, 1884, and then tragically died two days later on February 14th. TR wrote a large X in his journal for that day with the sentence, 
the light has gone out of my life. TR rarely spoke or wrote about her ever again. The two daughters of Theodore Roosevelt could not have had more different personalities from each other. On the left, Alice Roosevelt Longworth was the only child of Theodore Roosevelt and Alice Lee Roosevelt. Alice was a confident, witty, and headstrong individual. The press loved reporting on her scandalous antics as a young woman in the White House, including smoking, driving an automobile, gambling, having a pet snake named after her Aunt Emily. She often stepped in for Edith Roosevelt, who was intensely private and disliked the press, taking on some of the entertaining duties of the First Lady. Alice also acted as an ambassador for TR, traveling to Puerto Rico and Asia with official delegations. After her marriage to Republican Congressman Nicholas Longworth, Alice followed the tradition of her Aunt Bammy and hosted political salons in her Washington DC home. She was nicknamed the Other Washington Monument because she was a pillar of the Washington DC social and political scene from her arrival at the White House as TR's daughter in 1901 to her death in 1980. Alice's half-sister, Ethel, on the other hand, preferred to stay out of the spotlight, but she was a much beloved member of the family and of the Oyster Bay community. In a June 17, 1894 letter from Edith to her sister, Emily, Edith described Ethel as a bustling person, a born manager, and orders her brothers about constantly. Ethel had a personality that was similar to Edith's. She assisted Edith with managing logistics for the family and for Sagamore Hill. During her father's 1912 presidential campaign, Ethel helped to fundraise and canvass for the Progressive Party. When World War I broke out, Ethel served in the Red Cross, assisting her husband, Dr. Richard Derby, at the front in Europe. Ethel devoted 60 years of service to the Red Cross and even had her portrait painted in her Red Cross uniform. Throughout her life, Ethel was the keeper of Roosevelt family history. She assembled scrapbooks of family photos. She donated letters to the Theodore Roosevelt collection at Harvard and was instrumental in turning Sagamore Hill into a museum after her mother's death in 1948. This was a really short glimpse into the lives of TR's mother, younger sister, first wife and daughters. But now we'll move on to the two main subjects of tonight's talk, Anna Bammy Roosevelt Cowles and Edith Kermit Roosevelt. Late in life, the topic of Anna Roosevelt Cowles came up in an interview between Alice Roosevelt Longworth and her biographer. She said, I always believed that if she had been a man, she rather than my father would have been president. Anna Roosevelt was the first born to Mitty and Theodore Sr. in 1855. As a child, she was given the nickname Bammy from the Italian word for baby, Bambina. Later in life, she would also take on the nickname Bai, particularly among her nieces and nephews. That nickname was a result of the enormous amount of energy she had and her ability to accomplish tasks quickly. Her brother, Theodore Roosevelt, once wrote her from college, Oh, energy, thy name is Bammy. As a child, she suffered from debilitating back problems. She was prescribed different braces and then later exercised on the piazza that her father had built for his children to have a place to build their bodies at their New York City home. Bammy was a serious child, but she had a strong sense of wit like her mother. Like her siblings, Bammy was educated at home by her aunt Anna and later by tutors. Following one of the family trips abroad to Europe in 1867, Bammy entered a girls' school in Versailles under the direction of Madame Suvestre for several months. Bammy was born with a particular maturity and was often grouped in with the older adults rather than with her younger siblings, Theodore, Elliot, and Corinne. Even during the family's second trip to Europe in 1872, people thought that Bammy and her mother, Mitty, were sisters rather than mother and daughter. Bammy occupied several important roles in her family, companion to Mitty, co-manager of the household, and second mother to her younger siblings. Since her mother was delicate, Bammy took it, took it upon herself to take up the duties that would typically fall to Mitty. This trend of taking charge as both manager and caretaker continued all throughout her life. Her extended family, particularly Theodore, certainly profited from it. Her niece, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, once said, there is always someone in every family who keeps it together. In ours, it was Auntie Bai. 
Fami entered society in winter of 1873. Her coming out was hosted by family friends in Philadelphia, supposedly because her parents' grand new home at West 57th Street was not finished in time. But biographer Betty Boyd Caroli speculates it may have been due to Bammy not having many friends her age in New York at the time. Following her debut, even though she wasn't particularly beautiful, Bammy's circle of friends and male suitors grew. She developed a magnetic personality and captured the attention of anyone she was in company with through her wit and conversation. Bammy always seemed to know the right thing to do or say. She possessed a keen judgment and wisdom that went beyond her years. Yet for some reason, Bammy did not marry for over 20 years following her debut. As manager of the house and her family, Bammy secured and outfitted TR's first apartment at Harvard, taking care to find him an apartment on the second floor because of his asthma. Letters between TR and Bammy during his college years reveal how proud TR was of the reputation Bammy was building as a competent woman of the upper class. While TR was away at Harvard, Bammy experienced the crush of the death of their father due to stomach cancer. TR wrote to her following his father's death about how Bammy would have to step in for their father to counsel Theodore about his life. On a more positive note, she saw the love between her brother, Theodore, and his new love interest, Alice Hathaway Lee Blossom. After Alice and TR married in the fall of 1880, Bammy welcomed Alice into her circle in New York City. Alice relied on Bammy in those early years of marriage to Theodore, especially when he was on hunting trips or serving in the New York State Assembly. When Alice became pregnant in 1883, it was decided that Alice and TR would move into the home on West 57th Street so that Mitty and Bammy could watch over Alice while TR was away. It was in that home that Bammy had to experience both her mother and Alice dying on February 14, 1884. Bammy's responsibilities would increase exponentially following the deaths of her mother and her sister-in-law. She not only took TR's baby daughter, Alice Lee, under her care, but she also packed up the contents of the home at West 57th Street, cleared out her brother's home on 45th Street, and managed the distribution of Mitty's estate. As Theodore moved out west to his cattle ranch to deal with his grief, Bammy oversaw the construction of his new home at Oyster Bay, which was originally to be named Lee Home after his wife, Alice Lee, but then was later renamed to Sagamore Hill. Only someone with calm, steady managerial skills could manage this enormous pressure during such an emotional time. By this point, her siblings, Corinne and Elliot, were already married. With no living parents and no husband, Bammy had to figure out how to navigate New York City upper class society as a single woman with enormous family responsibilities. She carved a life out for herself by using money inherited from her parents' estate to buy brownstone at 422 Madison Avenue and to purchase stocks, bonds, and other real estate. She relished in caring for little baby Alice and the two formed a tight knit bond. While TR was away in the Dakotas, Bammy was a lifeline to what was happening with his family, his finances, politics, and news in general. Bammy kept him closely informed of all of the goings on. TR wrote to Bammy asking her to do things for him, like send him checks from his checkbook, send toys for one of his ranch hand's daughters. In one letter, TR mentioned that he thought it would be a good deal of years before he would get back into politics again. Although she knew that TR needed the time out west to revive himself following the deaths of Mitty and Alice, Bammy did not think he was destined to be a cattle rancher forever. She encouraged his political aspirations. TR relied on her for career and political advice for the rest of his life. Bammy was partly responsible for reuniting Edith and TR, though it is difficult to know whether she was conscious of it or not. TR apparently told both Corinne and Bammy to keep Edith away from him as the two had been a romantic pair as teenagers, but experienced a falling out when Theodore was in his early years at Harvard. TR did not think it was proper to remarry after Alice passed away. At one point, Bammy read in the newspaper that TR and Edith had gotten engaged and wrote to TR in an outrage that such an incorrect rumor would be printed. TR wrote back to Bammy confessing, that it was not a rumor and they were indeed to be married. He asked for her forgiveness in not telling her and for her blessing in their marriage. 
though he was surprised at himself that he was going to enter into a second marriage. Bami got over the shock and accompanied T.R. to his wedding to Edith in England in 1886. During T.R. and Edith's honeymoon, T.R. wrote several letters to Bami, asking her advice on his finances. He questioned whether she thought it would be a good idea to sell or rent Sagamore Hill to help economize their expenses. In one letter, he even called Bami the manager of the Roosevelts. Then there was the question of baby Alice. Prior to his marriage to Edith, T.R. believed that Bami would continue to raise Alice. However, all of this changed during their honeymoon when Edith told T.R. she wanted to raise Alice as her own. T.R. had to break the news to Bami, who was devastated at the thought of little Alice no longer being in her life every day. But Bami wanting Alice to grow up with her father as Bami had been able to grow up with her own wonderful father, relinquished custody of Alice to Edith and T.R. Upon Edith's and T.R.'s return from their honeymoon, Bami had Alice dressed up with a small bouquet of flowers for Edith, her new mother. Hints of tension between Edith and Bami continued to grow in their first year of marriage. Bami had been the one to decorate and furnish Sagamore Hill, but now it was Edith who was living there. Edith began to make her mark on the home, changing furnishings and taking charge of the accounts for T.R.'s estate and the money. When Edith and T.R.'s first son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was born, Edith coolly kept Bami and Curran at a distance during her recovery and instead brought back her old Irish nanny, Mame Ludwith, to assist her with Ted and Alice. Bami didn't have too much time to dwell on her new situation that put her at a distance from her beloved brother, as the larger Roosevelt family seemed constantly in need of her help. She continued in her role as perpetual caregiver caring for her brother Elliot and his family once it became apparent that Elliot's alcoholism was out of control. She accompanied Elliot and his family to Europe in hopes of being able to have him be treated at a sanatorium in France. After Elliot's family returned back to the United States, Bami stayed on in England to help care for cousin James Rosie Roosevelt, who had recently been widowed. While living in England and helping her cousin with his household and his children, Bammy made quite the splash in London society, even meeting the queen at one point. During this time, TR was a civil service commissioner in Washington, DC. He continued to run political ideas and decisions by her, communicating with her as an equal rather than just his sister. He even had Bammy act as an informal diplomat by asking her to discuss particular political ideas within her British social circle, such as the Venezuela and British Guyana border dispute. During her time in England, Bami met and became engaged to William Sheffield Cowles, who was an American naval attache at the, at the embassy in London. It's fitting that she should marry Cowles, who was in the US Navy, as her brother TR was very interested in the Navy and would later become the assistant secretary of the Navy. TR was worried about the relationship though, because Cowles had been previously married. He feared that Cowles' divorce, which had been granted in California, would not be valid in other states, and cautioned his sister not to get married until the matter could be legally reviewed and settled. TR may also have been worried about what this potential scandal would have meant, would have meant for his budding political career. Once everything was sorted out though, Bami and William Sheffield Cowles were married, and they would go on to have one son, William Sheffield Cowles Jr., who was Bami's pride and joy. Even after her marriage to Will, Bami continued to provide counsel for TR and also allowed TR and Edith to use her home in New York City whenever they needed. Bami's niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, later said that TR made few important significant political decisions and even fewer personal decisions without getting the input of his sister. The relationship wasn't always one way with Bami providing support to TR though, in 1893, TR secured an appointment for Bami to the New York State Women's Board, assisting with the women's building at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Bami was responsible for arranging loans for the exhibits. Following the Spanish-American War, TR's reputation in the United States rose like a rocket, and he won the position of governor of New York State. Bami was fiercely proud of him and the name he was making for himself in politics. Letters between TR and Bami during this time discussed TR's potential run for vice president. Bami was living in Washington DC at the time and kept TR informed of the political goings on. 
In a way, Bami was like a public relations specialist, helping to manage TR's image and next steps as his fame grew. After TR became president following William McKinley's assassination in 1901, Bami's house in Washington, D.C. became the second White House. As the widowed Ida McKinley moved her things out of the White House, TR used Bami's house to hold some of his first cabinet meetings. Bami's house would continue to be a refuge and meeting place for TR. Similar to how Bami felt after TR married Edith, Bami feared that TR becoming president had strained their close relationship again and put Bami at a distance. She lamented to Corinne, Theodore I see very seldom and almost always with outsiders. And of course, of necessity, except by some rare chance, we are entirely alone. Toward the end of TR's presidency in 1909, Bami and Will decided to make their home Old Gate in Farmington, Connecticut, their primary residence again. Without Theodore in the White House and with Will retired from the Navy, their presence in DC was not a necessity anymore. Back problems, arthritis, and deafness all caught up to Bami. She unfortunately could not attend TR's funeral in January 1919 because she was so immobile. And instead, Edith paid her a visit several days later. In the years following his death, TR was still one of Bami's favorite people to talk about amongst family and friends. She was a proud and devoted sister to him. Family was paramount to Bami. The young Roosevelts that Bami had helped raise, such as TR's daughter Alice and her niece Eleanor, pointed to Bami as one of the most important figures in their lives. Although Bami was a Republican, she maintained a very close relationship with her niece Eleanor, particularly as Frank Franklin's career in the Democratic Party took off. Bami once gave her the following important advice. Do not be bothered by what people say, as long as you are sure that what you are doing seems right to you, but be sure that you face yourself honestly. Bami died at her home in 1931, having lived a remarkable and extraordinary life. Bami and Edith were different in many ways. Bami was outgoing, while Edith was more reserved and introspective. Bami always believed TR would amount to something big politically and actively encouraged his pursuits. Edith wanted a quiet life with TR, focused on simple life pursuits, family, literature, and time together. Yet both Bami and Edith were excellent managers. TR would not have been able to achieve his many accomplishments without the guidance, support, and organizational skills of his wife and his sister. Edith Kermit Caro was born into the same social class as Bami and TR, but her family was not nearly as wealthy. Her father was involved in the Caro family shipping business. Edith and her family came on hard times after a series of misfortunate events occurred in the businesses and her father turned to alcohol to console himself. The Caro family could no longer to a fit, could no longer afford to live in their own house and instead relied on the kindness of their relatives who allowed them to move into their houses. It was these trying life experiences that probably made Edith a meticulous accountant and frugal manager of the Roosevelt finances and the estate at Sagamore Hill later in life. Edith's future changed, however, when she became friends with Corinne Roosevelt. Corinne and Edith were only months apart in age and shared a love for poetry and literature. The Roosevelts lived several blocks away from where Edith and her family lived, making it easy for the two to play together often. Mitty and Theodore Roosevelt Sr. allowed Edith to attend lessons with her children at their home on 20th Street. Edith was also invited to the Roosevelt, invited by the Roosevelt family to spend time with them at their rented summer home in Oyster Bay called Tranquility and to go on other vacations with the family. Edith became close with Theodore and the two began to exchange letters when Theodore and his family went to Europe. Youthhood friendship blossomed into a romantic relationship between TR and Edith as teenagers. In college, TR referred to Edith as the most cultivated, best read girl I know. The details have been lost to history, but many historians speculate that TR had proposed marriage to Edith as teenagers at least once. TR and Edith got into a huge argument about something one day, however, and their romantic relationship fell apart. Edith stayed in the family scene though, particularly because of her friendship with Corinne, but TR's attention shifted to his new object of affection in Boston, Alice Hathaway Lee. I think people would be really surprised to hear 
that Edith actually attended Theodore and Alice's wedding. She is said to have danced the soles off her shoes. Avoiding Alice and Theodore was not practical, given her longstanding relationship with the Roosevelt family. Edith attended a New Year's reception hosted by Corinne in Montreal with a large party of people, including T.R., Alice, and Bammy. We do not know of how Edith was notified of Alice and Mitty's death in 1884, nor what her feelings were about the subject. According to Alice Roosevelt Longworth, Edith once told her son, Ted Jr., that she felt like Alice would have bored T.R. to death had he stayed married to her. But it's difficult to know if Edith really felt that way. It's also interesting to wonder if T.R. would have become president if Alice had lived. As we discussed earlier, almost three years after Alice's death, Edith and T.R. were married at a small ceremony in England in December 1886. The pair honeymooned around Europe for several months and returned home to New York. They took up residence at Sagamore Hill and Edith gave birth to their first child, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. in September 1887. Edith and T.R. would go on to add four more children to their family for a total of six children, including Alice. Edith also suffered at least two miscarriages, which brought her both grief and health issues. After marrying T.R., Edith became responsible for raising the children, managing the household, maintaining the family's accounts, paying bills, overseeing Sagamore Hill, and managing Theodore. Edith sometimes joked that she had seven children, with the seventh being Theodore. Edith supposedly had to issue a daily allowance to T.R. because he was not good at tracking his money. In their letter, Courtship, after reuniting at Bammy's house, Edith wrote to T.R. in June 1886, Mama says, I must tell you that I'm very practical and I know a very good deal about money. And here are some images from Edith's checkbooks. We're very fortunate at Sagamore Hill to have some of her checkbooks and some of her account books. Um, and she is very meticulous when it came to her accounting. As TR changed jobs from civil service commissioner to New York City police commissioner, to assistant secretary of the Navy, to New York State governor, to vice president of the United States, and finally president of the United States, Edith had to coordinate moving the family and their things from house to house. It was no small task to just secure housing in each city, find appropriate schools or tutors for the children, and find staff to help care for the children and for the household. Sagamore Hill was always home base, though, and the family would return there each summer. Despite their strong love for each other, Edith and Theodore had very different personalities and visions for their life. Edith did not envision life on the public stage, while T.R. could not deny the pull of the political life and a life of public service. Edith had hoped for a quiet life at Sagamore Hill with her family, with T.R. earning money through his writing as an author. She had discouraged Theodore from running for mayor of New York in 1894, but later regretted holding him back from pursuing his aspirations. Perhaps this feeling contributed to her opinion that T.R. had made the wrong call following the 1904 election, saying that he would not seek another term as president. Edith became first lady at the age of 40 when they entered the White House rather unexpectedly following McKinley's death. Many historians refer to Edith as the first modern first lady. She was the first first lady to hire a social secretary, hiring Isabel Hagner, who had previously worked for BAMI and came highly recommended. Ms. Hagner helped Edith respond to her correspondence and organize social events at the White House. Edith also was influential in the renovation of the White House in 1902. She advocated for an enlarged separate family space from the formal offices and communicated design ideas with the architectural firm, the Kim Mead and White. Alice, excuse me, Edith took note of the mismatched and chipped White House China and commissioned a new set to make the White House more able to entertain the foreign heads of state properly. Valuing privacy, Edith worried about the press hounding her and her children for photographs. To mitigate these concerns, Edith hired photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston to take official portraits of the family that the White House distributed to the press for publication. Historians believe that Edith exerted a subtle influence over her husband during the presidency regarding political decisions. Edith and Tiara spent time together every day discussing current events. Each day, Edith read several newspapers and passed along clippings to T.R. that she thought were important. She also helped edit his many articles and speeches. 
Sometimes TR had a habit of talking too much at the dining table. Edith would reel him in by saying, now Theodore, so the conversation could move on to someone else. Edith also provided a back channel to TR, her informal correspondence with friends and influential foreign diplomats, such as Sir Cecil Spring Rice, informed and fed her conversations about politics with her husband. To get to TR, it was wise to be on good terms with Edith. In 1905, Edith wanted to ensure that TR and the family had a private place to retreat to for vacation that was close to Washington, DC. She purchased a small cabin and the family named the cabin Pine Knot in rural Keene, Virginia. Edith, who feared for the safety of her husband, especially following McKinley's assassination, brought the Secret Service out to Pine Knot without TR knowing to protect him while he was away from the White House. Following the presidency, Edith was looking forward to rest, privacy, and time alone with Theodore and her family. But that would have to wait while TR and Kermit completed a hunting expedition for the Smithsonian in Africa. TR carried this portrait of Edith, what he called the goddess portrait. It was his favorite image of Edith. He carried this portrait on each leg of his journey through Africa. Following the expedition, TR and Kermit met Edith and the rest of the family in Egypt for a grand tour of Europe. When they returned to the US, rest eluded Edith again. TR's handpicked successor, President William Howard Taft, was undoing many of TR's progressive policies. TR decided to run again for president in 1912. Although Edith was not very fond of this idea at first, she supported her husband and joined him on part of the campaign trail. During the campaign, a man by the name of John Shrank shot TR in an attempt to kill him in Milwaukee. Edith nursed her husband back to health following the assassination attempt and consoled him after his defeat in the election. Again, Edith hoped for quiet, but instead TR decided to go on another collecting expedition with the American Museum of Natural History in South America to explore the uncharted river of doubt. Edith accompanied him to Brazil and then went on her own route with a relative through South America and continued on home to Sagamore Hill. Fearing for her husband's health and safety though, Edith convinced their son Kermit to accompany TR. TR barely made it home alive. After the South American expedition, TR and Edith settled into a semi-quiet life at Sagamore Hill, the life that Edith had waited so long for. Many of their children were married and having grandchildren. They both relished their roles as grandparents. When World War I broke out, Edith and Tiara watched their four sons go overseas to fight and watched their daughter, Ethel, go overseas to serve as a nurse in France. In 1918, they suffered a terrible loss when their youngest son, Quentin, a pilot, was killed over enemy lines in France. His death may have precipitated Tiara's early passing himself the following year in 1919 at the age of 60. Edith outlived her husband by nearly 30 years. Her life after TR's death centered on her children, grandchildren, traveling the world, reading, writing, and needlework. Edith destroyed most of her personal correspondence with TR due to privacy, which obscures the true death of how Edith really influenced TR. She maintained Sagamore Hill as her home, and primary residence until her death in 1948. Despite her reserved personality, Edith was a devoted wife, mother, and first lady. In a letter from TR to his friend Mariah Storer in 1902, he wrote, I have never seen in any other woman the power of being the best of wives and mothers, the wisest manager of the household, and at the same time, the ideal great lady and mistress of the White House. Both Bammy and Edith deeply loved TR. They supported him behind the scenes through letters, sharing news, advice, and encouragement. They were informal advisors to him on politics, finances, career, and life decisions. TR sought and valued their opinions. He treated them as intellectual equals. It is hard to determine how well known their influence on him was publicly known at the time. This is the role that society would have put them in as upper-class women of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But among the Roosevelt family and its future generations, it has been an undisputed fact that both Bammy and Edith were indispensable in shaping Theodore Roosevelt into the man he became and the man that he's remembered to be.
Thank you everyone again for attending the lecture this evening. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is so much to know about the Roosevelt women. Um, so this is a slide that shows some different primary and secondary resources. If you're interested in reading more about them, I really encourage you to take a further look because um, the Roosevelt women are definitely complex figures and very interesting to read about. And the cool thing too is that some of the books towards the bottom are actually written by the women that I discussed. So I encourage everyone to check that out. And thank you again for attending this lecture. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thanks. Okay, hey, hello everybody. Hey, hello. Good evening. Uh, Laura, thank you. Excellent presentation. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, get into some, into some questions now. Does anybody that has uh, questions uh, start uh, putting them in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll have at it. Okay, so the first question, Laura, is from Jessica Taylor. Do you know what road tranquility is on? Oh, such a good question. Um, so we haven't been able to 100% pinpoint exactly where Tranquility was, but if you are local to Oyster Bay, it was on Cove Road and it was fairly close to where Oyster Bay High School is today. Terrific. Okay, the next one is from uh, Ginny Perel, fellow friends of Sagamore Hill. Uh, did the relationship between Edith and Bammy change after Theodore Roosevelt passed away? If so, in what way? That's a great question. It's something that I think I'd have to look a little bit more into some of the primary resources to figure out. Um, and it can be a little bit tricky tracking down the correspondence between Edith and Bammy after TR's passing. Um, but I think that TR's passing probably brought them together. Um, they both were so devoted to him, and I think without him in the world, I can imagine the two of them really kind of leaning on each other for support, especially in the years, um, I'd say, right after TR's death. Um, I mean, Edith had another home at Mortlake Manor in Connecticut, so she was in the area often, um, and with family not really being able to travel much after 1919, we know that Edith definitely would have stopped in and called on Bammy. Um, but thanks, Jenny. That's something that I have to look into a little bit more through some of the letters to see if you can see a difference in maybe the language that the two of them used following TR's death. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question is from Thomas Reigstad. So after FDR, did any Roosevelt's, especially women, participate in politics? Oh, that is a great question too. Um, I'm trying to think of the Roosevelt genealogy in my head. I know that several distant relatives were certainly married to people who participated in politics. Um, I'm thinking of some of the prominent family members today. I know that some of them have gone more into um, like journalism and reporting on politics. Um, and then also I'm thinking of one Roosevelt woman in particular who is an anthropologist. So none of them entered politics quite on the scale as Theodore and FDR did, but I'd say they're still pretty politically informed and are kind of in areas that are connected to politics. Excellent. Okay, next question is from Ed O'Keefe. He wants to know, imagine what, what would have been different about TR's life had Alice lived? That's a, that's a very interesting one. It's really fascinating to think about that idea. There's a lot of kind of what ifs. What if Edith and Corinne hadn't become friends? 
what if they hadn't had that argument when TR was going into, I think it was his junior year at Harvard. What if TR hadn't met Alice? What if Alice had lived in 1884? It's fascinating to think about those what ifs. Um, who knows if history would have been the same. Indeed, indeed. Next question is from Marilyn Landman. Did you find the photos and letters of Sagamore? Great question. Um, so it's definitely a mix um, in this presentation between photographs um, that are in the Sagamore Hill collection versus the Theodore Roosevelt birthplace collection, which is also a national historic site in New York City. Um, definitely worth a visit if you were ever in the area. Um, between those two resources, that's where the bulk of the photographs came from. A lot of the letters between TR, Bami, and Edith, the ones that survive still, most of them are housed at Harvard in the Theodore Roosevelt collection there. Um, and the really exciting thing is that a lot of those letters are digitized and they're available on the Theodore Roosevelt Center, which is a digital presidential library for Theodore Roosevelt. One um, actual like physical presidential library and museum is in the works of being built in North Dakota. But we have this really amazing Theodore Roosevelt Center that combines the different primary resources from our site, Theodore Roosevelt National, yeah, Theodore Roosevelt Birthplace National Historic Site, the inaugural site, Library of Congress, and Harvard. Um, and those resources are open to everyone. You don't have to be an academic researcher to look those up. Um, so if you just go to theodoreroosevelt.center.org, you too can read a lot of the letters between TR and BAMI. Um, those are the ones that I think are the most interesting. Excellent. Very next question, uh, Jonathan Parker. I, I think we know who that is. <laughs> uh, when visiting Sagamore Hill, where are what noteworthy tangible examples of Edith's, Edith's influence on TR into the property as a whole? That's, yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it's important to remember that when TR bought the property, he bought the property for him and Alice. And the most important thing to him was that he wanted to build a home where he would have a community of Roosevelt's around him. So I think it's important to recognize that when thinking about the shift from um, Alice's death to Bammy being the one to oversee the house to then Edith becoming the mistress of Sagamore Hill as Tierra wrote in that goddess portrait um, as the caption. So places that you could see Edith's hand today, um, I would point towards the pet cemetery. If you're ever there, there's a beautiful arbor and Edith liked to spend time over there. Edith was very interested in the garden and farms at Sagamore Hill. And there is an ongoing project to restore some of those gardens to Sagamore Hill. Um, so stay tuned there to see. Edith also, um, you know, romped around the site with the rest of the family and with TR, she had her own little respite called The Nest, which unfortunately no longer exists, um, but it was a place that she liked to escape to, to read and just enjoy. Um, if you're outside the house, I would encourage you to look up to the second floor above where the amazing um, wraparound porch is. If you're facing, if you're like looking at the western portion of the house, if you look up there, you'll see there's a small balcony um, that actually is right outside the master bedroom. And Edith would have spent a lot of time up there. Um, that was kind of like her other getaway other than the nest to basically just get away from it all and be able to take a nap or read a book and just have some quiet time there. Um, so those are the things that I would kind of look at Sagamore Hill and the landscape if you do visit as places that were important to Edith and that Edith had a hand in kind of directing what their use was going to be. Terrific. Okay, this next one is from Calvin Watts. Several authors, including Patricia O'Toole, have implied Edith was slightly resentful of TR's mentality on war and their four sons going after Quentin's death. 
I know Edith gave the quote of, you can't raise your sons to be eagles and expect them to be sparrows. But is there any documentation to let us know, one way or another, if they reconciled on this before uh, Theodore Roosevelt's death? That's a fantastic question. And it's a quote that um, I think is really important to understanding Edith's mentality. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of the private correspondence between Edith and TR. Um, and it's a short amount of time, you know, from Quentin's death to TR's death. TR is in the hospital for some of that time period. Um, so he, he and Edith would not have been together, um, but it's hard to know what their personal conversations were like on that topic. Um, it's something that I definitely will look into more, but to my knowledge, I don't know of a primary resource that really kind of describes that reckoning with Quentin's death and having all of their sons, you know, participate in the military. I think it's interesting also to think about, um, I've always been interested in knowing, you know, what was Edith's view when TR was a rough rider? I mean, TR writes about how he's gonna go down, you know, to be in the Spanish American war and he's expecting to be killed there. He doesn't think he's gonna come back uh, to New York, to Sagamore Hill, to his family. And I haven't read something where Edith has really opened up about her emotions during that time period. I don't know if it's something that she would have written about considering she was a really private person. Um, maybe it's in something, you know, maybe it's in one of those letters that unfortunately she burned. So I'm not sure if there's really a way to know, but it's certainly something interesting to think about. Extremely interesting. Fascinating. Next one from Pete Gumas. How did, how did Edith deal with TR and deal with her own grief? Well, that's somewhat related there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, in terms of dealing with the grief from Quentin's death, um, Edith and TR following Quentin's death went up to Ethel's summer home, which was in Maine. Um, that was kind of their immediate escape from Sagamore Hill, I think the really heartbreaking thing about that too is, you know, Quentin's letters were coming in delayed and at different times. So they received letters from him after they knew that he had passed away. Um, and those letters, some of them were forwarded to Dark Harbor um, in Maine for them to read together. So I do kind of imagine them opening some of those letters together, reading through them, and really just leaning on each other and leaning on their surviving children who were around them at that point, which would have been Ethel and Archie and Alice because Ted Jr. and Kermit were still overseas. And then Edith dealing with her grief after TR's passing, um, I'd really say travel. Travel was her way of dealing with grief. Um, I don't think she really wanted to be at Sagamore Hill in the winter months, especially around the anniversary of TR's death. So she would often plan her travels to be away from Sagamore Hill um, during that period. She did, however, though, um, you know, continue to host visitors to the home, especially uh, members of the military and Boy Scouts who would do this annual pilgrimage, um, you know, related to TR but I'd say travel was really her way of dealing with grief. Absolutely. Next one is from uh, Lindsay Davenport, another, a uh, fellow, fellow curator at Sagamore Hill. Did the Roosevelt women support women's suffrage? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I mentioned that Corinne, who was Tiara's younger sister, did not support suffrage. Um, and it's really interesting to look at because you have this generation of, you know, upper class women. So Bami, Corinne, Edith, Bami and Corinne are not supporters of women's suffrage. From what we know, we know that Bami's husband will at some point is serving in like the Connecticut state um, legislature and he votes no on suffrage. 
Some historians have pointed to a primary source where um, Bami and Corinne talk about how extending suffrage to women would increase the stupid vote, um, which is very strong language. And I was certainly surprised to see that. And then you have someone like Edith, who was called a lukewarm supporter of women's suffrage. Um, then you have TR, who wrote this very interesting senior paper at Harvard on the practicability of equalizing men and women. Um, so he is more of a supporter of suffrage than his sisters and then his wife were. Um, but even TR is not really uh, strong in his support and public voice of women's suffrage until he joins the Progressive Party. Um, and that's one of the platforms that the Progressive Party runs on in 1912. After women get the right to vote, after TR passes away, the women who were skeptical or unsupportive, um, so Edith, Corinne, Bami, they do become more um, political publicly. Edith will campaign for Herbert Hoover and give a big speech at Madison Square Garden supporting him. Um, Corinne, as we talked about, you know, will be really involved in the Women's Republican Committee. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to kind of look at women's suffrage in this kind of greater lens of the time period, the social class that the Roosevelt's occupied, um, but to see that they all had really different opinions from each other. They were not united in one particular way of thinking about women's suffrage. And that extended to their daughters. I mean, Alice and Ethel, I think, were more interested in the idea of women's suffrage and were maybe more exposed to it. TR did have um, you know, supporters of women's suffrage at Sagamore Hill in 1917, especially. Um, so they would have seen their father having conversations with suffragists. Um, and I think that kind of offered a different perspective on them personally when it came to their ideas about women's suffrage. Indeed. Thank you. Ellis and Hayford uh, once they asked, here's letters to Alice were quite romantic. Is there any evidence of similar intensity of feelings for Edith or did their relationship dif uh, differ? Also, did anyone else think Alice was not so intelligent or was the TR would have been bored comment the only reference? Two good questions. Um, so yeah, the letters between Alice and TR are very different, I'd say, than surviving letters between TR and Edith. Um, but I think it's important to look at the age of TR and the life experienced when you think about his marriage with Alice versus his marriage with Edith. Um, with Alice, in a way he treats Alice almost similar to how he treated his mother. Um, so looking at the language when he writes to his mother, dear little motherling, he always talks about sweet baby, pretty Alice. Um, it's similar. He does not talk about Edith that way at all. We do know though that Edith and TR did really have a deep love for each other. And I imagine that some of those letters that Edith burned did have a lot of passion to them. I mean, when you think about it, Edith and TR had five children. They um, had obviously had more had wanted to have more children and Edith experienced those miscarriages. So we know that they wanted to grow their family even more. Um, so I do think the passion was there, but I think that it's important to keep in mind that TR had already gone through this grief and suffering with Alice um, and it ages him in a way. He gains a lot more life experience during those two years being a widower. Um, and maybe he does approach his relationship with Edith in a little bit more of a guarded way at first, um, but he's also more mature. And he doesn't think that he's gonna get married again. And at first I think he was almost embarrassed that he is getting married again. It was something he was very against. So I think it's important to consider those things when you're looking at difference in language between Edith and Alice when it came to corresponding with TR. Absolutely, <laughs> thank you. 
Next one is Deborah Jensen. Did Bammy ever stay at Sagamore Hill while Edith was his wife to spend time with the family? Yes, yes. Um, Bammy did come out to Sagamore Hill. She would spend time with the family. Um, at first, we talked about following Ted Jr.'s birth. Edith kind of kept Bammy and Corinne a little bit at a distance. They had definitely offered to come to Sagamore Hill to help, help with the baby, help with um, Edith's recovery. So I think initially that was a way of Edith kind of carving out Sagamore Hill as her own space and waiting before she invited Bammy and Corinne, you know, to visit the family to see the new baby. Um, but definitely, yeah, Bammy would have come to Sagamore Hill and stayed, you know, over the summer when the family was there. Absolutely. Okay, from Shannon Moak. Uh, you've done a great job illustrating how Edith made Sagamore Hill her home. Uh, did she have any concerns initially moving into the house TR built for his life with Alice? Yeah, it's interesting. I wish that we had, first of all, the diaries that we do have of Edith's are not very descriptive. They don't have a lot of emotion in them. They're mostly kind of just recordings of daily life. So we don't really know 100% what her feelings were like, you know, coming to Sagamore Hill as this home that was built in a way not intended for her. Um, but at the same time, you know, Edith was very comfortable with Oyster Bay. She had visited the family at Tranquility, uh, obviously when her and TR were on good terms as children and, you know, possibly romantically intertwined. TR had rowed her around Cold Spring Harbor, had rowed her around Oyster Bay. So she was certainly very comfortable with the idea, I think, of living in that community. The other thing to think about too is um, Edith at kind of just prior to her marriage to TR, Edith's mom and sister have decided that they need to move to Europe to economize. Um, they were running low on money and to be able to live kind of at the same lifestyle level that they had lived in in New York City, they realized they had to move to Europe. So it's interesting to consider if Edith had not married TR, would Edith have stayed in Europe with her mom and with Emily, um, who were kind of they were they were personalities. They were a little a little different. Um, or would she have stayed on her own in New York City in the U.S.? So that's something interesting to consider too. Absolutely. Hey, from Jessica Taylor, uh, when do you know when Edith uh, supposedly destroyed all of her, her TR correspondence, her love letters, and whatnot? I don't know. I'm trying to think if. I've read anywhere that attached a date to it. I think most of the resources that I've looked at just say sometime before her death. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure if that means, you know, in the 1940s, she's looking through the correspondence and then she gets rid of it, or if it's a more knee jerk reaction after TR's death, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so we've got a question from Steve Gilroy. It's actually several questions from Steve here. Uh, let's see, we've got, did Edith, did Edith ever visit Bullock Hole in Georgia or the TR birthplace in New York City later in life? So she definitely visited the TR birthplace in New York City later in life. She was involved with the Roosevelt um, Memorial Association, the Women's Roosevelt Memorial Association in um, recreating the birthplace. Uh, so we know that she definitely would have visited there. I'm not sure about visiting Roswell. I know that TR visits Roswell during the presidency. I want to say it's in 1905. I think Edith goes with him, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't recall her going to Roswell after TR's death at all, but I think she might have been there when TR went during the presidency. Terrific. Hey, from Patricia Dugan, are there any descendants of the Roosevelt family still involved in politics, especially any women? Yeah, so we talked about that a little bit before. Um, I can't think of 
Roosevelt women that are holding an elected office right now. But honestly, there are so many Roosevelt relatives, it's really hard to keep track of all of them. Um, I know that some of them have gone into journalism, some of them certainly cover politics in their journalism. Um, but I can't think of a female Roosevelt relative right now that holds a public office. Um, it's something I will look into though. Okay, next one. Did Edith know the truth about the death of her son, Kermit? So um, she did not know that Kermit had committed suicide. She was told by her family that he died of a heart attack. Um, Edith was really close to Kermit. She, I think though, would not have been blind to his struggles especially considering that Edith's own father had issues with alcohol. Edith was certainly aware of Elliot's issues with alcohol. Um, so I don't think she would have been surprised that Kermit was struggling with alcohol and with mental health. Um, the two of them are very close, especially after TR's death. A lot of her traveling, she does internationally, she does with Kermit, and the two of them work on several writing projects together. So those two books that Edith um, published, those were with Kermit's help. So she was definitely very close with him, um, but I think that, yeah, the family just wanted to spare her um, the disappointment, you know, of hearing that her son kind of met his death in that way especially knowing that, you know, Quentin had died in World War I. Um, I think at the point that Kermit passes away, Ted Jr. is not deceased yet, but I'd have to double check the year order. Um, but from what we know, Edith was not told that it was suicide. She was told that it was a heart attack. Okay, next. In the almost 30 years after her husband's death, did Edith ever host any political events at Sagamore Hill? I can't think of a large political event that she hosted at Sagamore Hill. I'd say that she, if it was in terms of like a scale type thing, she mostly hosted smaller parties. Um, I think the bigger thing she would have hosted would have been those Boy Scout pilgrimages, um, you know, to honor TR. Those are the big gatherings that I can really think of after TR's passing. Was there ever a time when, when Edith was ill and TR left her for, for a political event? I can think of a lot of times, probably too many to count. Um, it's really crazy when you start to read about the Roosevelt family because it seems like someone is always ill, whether it's the children are ill, they have measles, they have chicken pox, they have this, they have that. Um, if you look at the letters, it feels like someone is always reporting that someone in the family is ill. Um, and Edith definitely had some illnesses, also some accidents. You know, she was thrown off one of her horses at one point. Apparently she was in a coma for several weeks. Um, so I can't think of like one specific time where TR left Edith when she was sick or injured, but it certainly happened considering how prevalent injury and illness seem within their family. So question from Deborah Jensen, um, let's see. Actually, I think actually we already answered that one. Uh, looks like the last question right now, unless anybody has any more, but uh, this is from Leslie Peters. Was it commonplace at the time for an aristocratic woman to not support women's suffrage? Yeah, it really was commonplace. Um, I think there was, I think it goes back to kind of this generational aspect that I touched on before where women who you know, we're in the same generation and in the same social class as Bammy and Corinne and Edith. 
they seem to develop these notions that they did not need the right to vote because they were informing their husband's political views and his vote. So it was almost like their husband's vote was their own vote too. Um, it, I think it's, it's strange to, to think that way. I guess in modern times, we would be surprised that women would be against women's suffrage. Um, but it was certainly common in the class that um, Bami, Corinne, and Edith ran in, whether that's a result of their upbringing, their schooling. Um, they didn't formally, many of these women didn't go to college. They didn't go to formal schools. They were educated at home. So I think that those types of thinking come from in part their upbringing and how they were educated, who they were surrounded by, um, but also, you know, what would their husbands think of how they felt politically? Um, it seems like, at least in the case of Corinne and Bami, they didn't think it was necessary for women to vote. Um, and I really think that they thought that their husbands were voting with them in mind. Fascinating. No, Laura, actually, I, I have a question for you. Uh, yep. This is, do you know, do you have any insight on, on, I guess, um, Corinne and Corinne Bami and Anita's uh, point of view on T.R. possibly running, running for president again in 1920? I know that he mentioned the last few months of his life to assist the Corinne, uh, you know, about seriously running, about making one last run into politics. Do you have any insight on, on his uh, discussions? I would definitely have to look back more at primary sources. I could see Bami and Corinne being very supportive of another run, um, just because they seem to really, you know, throw all of their support behind him, especially when it came to politics. I could see Edith being a little bit more cautious about it, um, not only from the kind of privacy aspect that we talked about earlier with her hesitancy at kind of having her family be on this public stage. But honestly, TR's health is not good leading up to his death in 1919. I mean, he goes through the trolley accident during the presidency. He goes through the assassination attempt. He goes through almost dying, you know, during the River of Doubt expedition. And he's in the hospital at the end of 1918. So it's, it's hard for me to imagine Edith being 100% on board with him running again, just because I feel like, you know, she's the person that saw him every day and saw his health. Um, and I don't know if she would have felt like he was strong enough to not only run again, but serve another term as president. Terrific. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, let's see, unless anybody has any last minute questions, I think that's, uh, that's it for the evening. Yeah, it looks right. like uh, looks like we're we're at an end. But Laura, just want to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. Lenora, thank you, uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting up at Buffalo. I want to uh, echo Brian's thanks to Laura. Um, Laura, this was fantastic. I learned I learned some things, so that's always a great presentation in my mind. And thank you, Brian, for. Uh, for moderating our Q&A. Thank you for everyone who has um, stuck with us th through this, through the whole thing. Not that it was difficult to stick with it, but you know, we appreciate everyone's time. And um, we appreciate Laura's expertise. I will uh, mention to everyone that the TR site's next speaker night uh, will be the fourth Tuesday in April. And our speaker will be Steve Peraza, who is a professor of history at Buffalo State College. He'll be looking at the Niagara movement and its place in the long civil rights movement. So um, this is a talk I've actually been, we had hoped to have it last year, um, but we are really excited to be bringing it to you next, uh, next month. We're also happy to be partnering with the Niagara Falls Underground Railroad Heritage Center to bring Dr. Peraza's talk to everyone at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, April 27th. So we hope we'll see, see some of, uh, everybody will join us then. It will be on our website in the next uh, 
few days. And um, again, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll leave the chat open for um, for a little bit of uh, if anyone has any final thoughts or last minute questions. Um, so. And Laura, um, we'd had a couple, you were, you were busy answering questions. We had a couple of requests for the reading list. If you send that to me, I'll um, share it with everyone in a follow-up email. Great. Can... I uh, copy pasted it into the chat, but the formatting is a little wonky. So I will send that to Lenora um, if anyone is interested in looking at more of those resources. Yeah, I'll get those out to everybody tomorrow. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank, thank you, you, Laura. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you, Travis, for you know doing your behind the scenes magic. And uh, <laughs> there he is. Um, we will see everyone next month. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.